Hey everybody, Ben Faust here from Dwell Community Church, continuing our teaching series through the book of Ephesians that we've been putting together for YouTube. And uh, this week we're up to chapter 6, verse 5 is where we're going to start if you have a Bible and you want to follow. Um, we're into a very practical section of the book of Ephesians where Paul, our author, he's been taking all these big ideas that he laid out like uh, walking God's way, walking in love, and then applying those to really practical, like everyday relationships. So we've learned about husbands and wives, and children and parents, and now today he's going to address the relationship between slaves and masters. And so let's read and see what he has to say. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Now, masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember that you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. So, this is the passage that we're working with. Hey, are you guys sure that it's supposed to be me this week? Is, it, is this possible? Is it Mike Sullivan's week? No? Left ball? No, it's me. Okay, well, yeah. Like, what do we do with this passage? You know, the first time I read it, I was like, uh, what is the meaning of this? You know, is this passage condoning slavery? Because uh, it seems like that at first read, at least tacitly. And if it's not, if it doesn't mean that, then, then what the heck is it saying? And so there's a lot to grapple with here, but here's the thing about studying the Bible is so often our first impressions hit us this way, but when we do a little bit of interpretive work uh, to understand what's really being said here, what comes out are some really powerful and relevant and actually awesome truths that are here. But we do have to do a little interpretive work. We have to clear these hurdles first. Here's the thing to understand about a passage like this, is that a passage like this is occurring in a context. And context really, really matters. And if you take something out of context, the meaning can change substantially. So I'll give you an example. If I told you that, uh, here's some facts about me. Uh, sometimes I wear little um, thread friendship bracelets. And I, I love to wear them. I like to pick out pretty colors for them. And uh, I have several of them. I have one that matches my BFF. Those are all true facts. I'm a 41-year-old male. But they're facts out of context. Now let me just provide a little bit of context to that, which is that I also have an 11-year-old daughter who likes to make them for me. And it's like, oh, as soon as you hear that, the meaning really changes. It's far less, uh, you know, weird and, and concerning put in its proper context. And a passage like this can kind of be like that. This passage has uh, multiple contexts. It has a historical context because it was written by an actual person. Uh, two actual people in a real-life situation. It also has a literary context because it's part of a flow. It's part of a, a train of thought. And uh, it also has a biblical context. This is being said in a world of ideas that the author and the audience understood that come from the Bible. And so we need to look at those to understand this. The historical context for a passage like this was Roman slavery which was an, a huge part of Roman society, very important uh, in, in the Roman world. And one thing to get about this is that uh, when I say slavery, speaking of first century slavery, it's not necessarily exactly how we think of slavery. Um, you know, slavery is a loaded word for us. It brings to mind uh, things that we know about American slavery in the 19th century and before. And yeah, there is some overlap here, but it's not exactly the same and that's important. Like, for example, Roman slavery was not based on race. People of any race became slaves. Mostly how people entered slavery, honestly, was owing a debt, and you enter slavery to repay that debt. Or maybe you belonged to a nation that was conquered by the Roman Empire, or maybe you were an orphan. But it wasn't based on race, and it also wasn't based on class. People from all the different classes, except the very top, 
sometimes entered into slavery. Some slaves were unskilled, but some slaves were very highly skilled or even very highly educated. Some slaves were more educated than their master even. So it isn't based on those things. It also wasn't necessarily for your entire life because slaves could own land and save money. Sometimes slaves earned enough money to be free by the age of 30 or so. And so it, it's a slightly different picture. The other thing to understand here is that this slavery was the basis, the bedrock of the Roman economic and labor system. This is just like how work worked in the Roman Empire. There was somewhere between 30 and 60 million slaves by this point in Rome. That's like a full third of their population. And in cities, that was much more concentrated. So in an average city, you would probably have more slaves than free people. So it, it stands to reason then that this is the life situation of many, maybe even most of the people in Paul's audience. So he's not addressing like a social issue. He's not addressing some unique situation. He's addressing the basic work life of most of the people in his audience. And I think that's why what, what I'm going to say later is that I think honestly the best way to apply this in, in modern life, the closest modern parallel we have is our work life. That, that's what the people in Paul's audience are just asking. What does it look like to do this part of my life as a follower of Christ. Now, here's the, here's the other thing, is that there's a biblical context too, and that's actually where the problem is. Because the biblical ideas about slavery are in a head-on collision with the Roman ideas about slavery. The Bible comes in um, with this radically progressive view of all people. It just cannonballs into the pool with this whole new way of thinking that all human beings are created in the image of God and therefore have an intrinsic precious value. Regardless of their status as slaves, regardless of their race, regardless of their capabilities or anything else, that they're valuable because they have the fingerprint of God and they're precious to him and therefore all people are valuable. That's an alien idea in Roman thinking where some people were definitely more valuable than others. And so this, this idea bombs in, and then you add on top of that the fact that God, we see in the gospel, God gives his son for the sake of all people. You know, the, the Bible teaches that each one of us falls short of God's standard. And therefore, on a rescue mission, God put on flesh, came and died in our place on the cross for all people. And the invitation, therefore, to come and receive his forgiveness and be made right with him. That's extended to every single person, regardless of their circumstances or background or anything else. And when we, in our heart, turn to God to receive that forgiveness, we, with that comes an acceptance that's really a whole new identity. That's what we've been reading about in this book, that you're adopted into God's family, that you become citizens of heaven with all the status that comes with that, and therefore when we look to each other, we see each, each other as brothers and sisters, equals. The gospel casts out any idea of superiority one over the other. And so this is like this whole new set of ideas, and it leads to radical verses like Galatians 3.28, where he says, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. These are powerful new ideas, and they created a real disruption. So is this passage condoning slavery? Well, no, that's eliminated by the biblical context. I think what we wrestle with then, most of us, for me anyway, it's like, okay, but then why doesn't Paul call for an end to slavery? Because he doesn't in this passage. And that's a really good question. I think the thing about that question is it's a question from our point of view, from our modern point of view. This question makes sense from our lens. But it, it wasn't really the question of the audience at the time. You know, there wasn't an open question or dispute about slavery. Slavery was an accepted part of Roman life at this point. Here's Klein Snodgrass. He says, he's a commentator. He says, slavery was so much a part of life that hardly anyone thought about whether it might be illegitimate. It was considered an economic and practical necessity and assumed part of life just as much as the birds and the trees. This was just the environment that they lived in. 
And, uh, and so ideas of working against this, arguing against it, those would be very unpopular ideas. Those are ideas that uh, would have drawn suspicion on Christians who were already, people were already wondering, is this a social ill? You know, to endorse a slave revolt, that would just not be a realistic option for someone like Paul. That had been tried in Roman history. Just years earlier, um, uh, Spartacus had led a great slave revolt. He had 70,000 slaves that rose up and fought, and the Romans had to bring in their army from the front to fight them, but they did fight them and they defeated them. And Spartacus's men were absolutely slaughtered. Of the 70,000 who rose up, only 6,000 survived. And those 6,000 were then rounded up and crucified one after another, lining the entire road as a statement, this is what happens when you mess with Rome. And so, and so you know, for a lot of people, this really settled the issue on slavery. Here's these Christians, this tiny little upstart religion, this tiny little, uh, this tiny little uh, group, a minority, that were some of the only people in the entire empire who even had a basis to question slavery. And so uh, to rise up in revolt would have certainly just been the end of the entire movement. They would have been slaughtered. And I think Paul knows that. Instead, what we see in the Bible is a much more subversive approach. We see Christianity undermining slavery from within. And that is exactly what happened, that these ideas that I've just laid out, these are the very ideas that over time, over centuries, corroded and eventually destroyed slavery. It really begins here. So you look at verses like Philemon 1.8, for example. He was a slave owner. He owned a slave named Onesimus. And in this passage, Paul is writing to Philemon to persuade him to release Onesimus. Here's what he says. He says, that's why I'm boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do. I could demand that you release him. But because of our love, I prefer to simply ask you. Consider this as a request from me. And then later he says, he's no longer a slave like you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Or maybe you look at a passage like 1 Corinthians 7, 21. Paul says, are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. Because God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. The message here, I think, is really interesting. He's saying, listen, if you're a slave, if you can change your situation, do it. But if you can't, then you can look to Christ for your identity and strength and hope. You don't need to despair and worry about your situation. And I think that's important because the truth is, in a lot of cases, they, they couldn't change their situation. I think that this advice holds up really well today, by the way. If there's something that we can do to improve our society, we should do it. We have not just the freedom, but I would even say the obligation to do that. You know, we're told uh, in verses like uh, Isaiah 1, 17, to learn to do right, to seek justice, to encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. This is our obligation where we can do it. But that's not what Paul is writing about in this passage. He's writing to Roman subjects, to imperial subjects, who really don't have power. And what he's saying is when we don't have power, uh, we look to Christ. This is the question that they're wondering. How do I live in this society as an imperial subject and as a follower of Christ? That's what he's trying to address. Now, there's also a literary context here. There's also a flow of thought in the book and for that, what we have to understand is the whole genre of literature here. What Paul is writing is what is referred to as a household code. And this was a really common style of writing in the ancient world. You'd have philosophers and writers, and they would, they would pen down, here's what the ideal household would look like. Here's the, I, the virtuous husband or wife. And they would go through the basic relationships in the household. That's exactly what Paul is doing here. 
And that's why I think that it makes sense that he's including masters and slaves because as we've said, that was a normal everyday relationship for his audience. Often slaves lived in the same household as masters. And so Paul's simply giving his take. Here's what, here's what a, a virtuous household looks like when it comes to parents and children and husbands and wives and slaves and masters. What do these everyday relationships done God's way look like? And what's really interesting here too is that uh, Paul, you know, we're getting his Christian spin on a household code. Paul's household code is actually very subversive in many ways. It's different than a traditional household code. You know, traditionally the household code would just address the ones in authority and it would focus on the rights and privileges of those in authority and it would stress the obedience of those who are subjugated. But Paul really flips that. Paul, for example, addresses directly the subordinates, children, slaves. He speaks right to them. Paul's household code emphasizes the restrictions on those in authority and, how, and calls on them to use their authority for love like Christ did sacrificially. And it emphasizes the protections and equality of those who are subject as, as their own man or woman standing before God. And so let's read now, let's read it again now with all this context in our mind and, and see how it looks. He starts with the slaves, all right? So, so those of you who are under authority, here's wisdom for you living as a Christian. He says, be obedient. Slaves, you should be obedient when you're under authority. And then he, he describes that. He says, with deep respect and fear. This is just an expression. It's like, the, it's like the highest level of respect. Show the utmost respect. He says that you should serve sincerely, not just when they're watching you and with all your heart. You know, slaves, there were stereotypes about slaves. They had reputations of being sneaky and dishonest and stealing. He's saying you should do your job well and not just in a sneaky way when they're watching, but in a genuine way with all your heart. He says that their attitude should be enthusiastic. You should have a positive attitude toward your work. Why? Why was it important for them to do these things? Well, I think the answer is right here. Here's maybe the most important part. He says, do this as slaves of Christ. And that is one of Paul's favorite expressions. That, that, when Paul says that, he's talking about his identity in Christ as someone who has been bought by Christ, by the blood of Christ. And he says, now Jesus is my master. I belong to him and my loyalty and service is to him. The one who laid his life down for me, that's the one I serve. And so for Paul to be a slave of Christ, he wore that like a badge of honor. And he's reminding them, Jesus is your real master. That's why you should do these things well. Not because your earthly master is respectable or good. He might, he might be a total jerk. He might be completely unrighteous but he's not your true master. Your true master is Christ and that's who you serve. And that idea absolutely saturates this whole passage. It is literally in every line. He says, obey your earthly masters, implying that there is another unearthly master. He says, serve them as you would serve Christ. He says that you should do the will of God as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. And so this idea is just permeates the whole thing. And do you, do you realize what a subversive idea this is? To tell slaves, your master is not your true master. He's not the one with true authority. You answer directly to the Lord in heaven. I also think that a reason he's giving them this instruction is to help them navigate the social tension that's created by their new freedom. You know, they, they have just been told in this book that we studied, that they have an incredible new level of freedom. They've, we've just read how they have a, a whole new identity that supersedes any other identity. Their identity as a slave is superseded by their identity of Christ, which pushes other things out with this massive expulsive force. Here's who you are now, a person in God's image. You're precious to God. You are adopted into his family. You're citizens of heaven destined to share in his status and glory and power. 
Can you imagine hearing this for the first time as a slave? Like, how empowering would that be? That would be amazing, and I'm sure that they are feeling their freedom. It also rocked the boat with the Romans. Imagine being a Roman authority and, read, and, and hearing this. Imagine walking into a Christian meeting and seeing a slave, a Christian slave, sitting next to a Christian master and the two of them treating each other like equals and brothers. That was a direct threat to the entire Roman way of life. And, uh, and I think Paul sensed that this was something that was going to draw persecution. And that's why he's saying, look, we need to have excellent behavior despite this freedom that we have. You know, something else that I see in this passage that I feel like is really important is that while I said, you know, I said earlier uh, that when we have power to change things around us, we should. We should use it. But the reality is in a fallen world, in all kinds of circumstances, there are times when we don't have power. And that's really the circumstance of who Paul is writing to. And so, one of the cool things that we get in this passage are promises for the powerless. If you're in a situation where you really don't have the power to change things around you, the word has something to say by way of encouragement to you. For example, even when you're powerless, you are yet incredibly powerful in Christ. Do you hear how he's saying that to them? He's reminding them, you guys actually do have, we're never powerless in Christ because we have our witness and what, and, and what we can show people about Christ and how we live. We're never powerless because we have love. That's the great Christian superpower, is that because of Christ, we can love our enemies. In his great chapter about loving our enemies, Paul concludes in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul's injecting love into this equation. What, what would the average master think by a slave acting in love toward him? That would be mind-boggling. And we're also never powerless as long as we have the gospel on our lips because the news about Christ, that is the, those are the words that save. Those are the words that can turn any heart to Christ. And you want to talk about the best way to defeat slavery when these slave masters come to Christ in their heart. And you see that in passages like Titus 2.9. He says, it's a very similar passage. He says, urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering or stealing, but showing all good faith. Why? So that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. That their behavior is it magnifies the message of Christ, which is our mission in this world. So you're never powerless as long as you have the gospel. Also, even when your circumstances in a fallen world are hopeless, you yet have ultimate hope in Christ. That's another message to the powerless. Our hope is not on this earth. Our hope is in the future when Jesus Christ returns and he will wipe away the world system and all of its injustice and we'll replace it with the kingdom of Christ where we will all stand before him. That is our true hope. Even when you suffer unjustly, you are promised ultimate justice in Christ. You know, the fact is, guys, in a fallen world, we're all going to suffer unjustly sometimes. But when that happens, we need only look to Christ who also suffered injustice, injustice on our behalf. And we know that justice will be served. God says every sin, every wrong done, every evil act will be answered for, either by the perpetrator standing before God himself in judgment or by the blood of Christ on the cross. Justice will be served, and we know that. No one gets away with anything. And we also know that when we endure injustice for his sake that he sees, this, is, this is, was his reminder to the slaves. The last verse to the slaves, he says, remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. God says, when you choose to do good in the face of evil, I see that and I see what that costs you and I will remember and reward you. I used to work at a fancy hotel as like a, like a bellhop. Uh, and I remember one time we had this guy come in, he was a big wig and he needed a ton of things. It was like he, I got called down to take his bags up. 
I got called up to his room for room service. I got called up to his room for the phone, and then again for the Wi-Fi, and then again to help him take his bags back down. Never tipped me once. And I remember on his way out the door, he stopped and turned and said, you, you really helped me today. What's your name? And I said, Ben Faust. And he said, Ben Faust. And he took that and he wrote it down and he left. And the other employees came up around me and they were like, dude, do you know who that is? And I was like, no, who is it? And they're like, that's the owner of the hotel. I was like, oh man, that's a really good place to be. And that's what he's saying, slaves, that's the position that you're in. I see the sacrifices that you're making and I will remember them. Well, he says a word to the masters as well. And uh, so here, the Christian should be thinking, how should I act as a Christian when I have authority? Totally different question. And this verse is even more, sub, uh, even more subversive than the last. He says, treat your slaves in the same way. That's easy to pass over, but don't pass over it. Treat them in the same way. All the things I just said for the slaves, same goes for you and some other stuff too. That means that the master needs to be the model in having respect for other people. The master needs to be the model in hard work and integrity. And that the master should be uh, the model in enthusiasm and goodwill toward others. And that, and that the master should be characterized by submissiveness. Something that a lot of people miss, the way this whole household code began back in 521, Paul said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. All of us should have an instinct to submit to others out of reverence for Christ, and that should color the master in the same way. You see, this is a completely different take on what it means to be a master. This master would stand out from all others. He says, don't threaten them. So again, a limitation on his authority. That's not how we motivate as a Christian leader. Uh, we don't threaten. Your authority is not a platform for your self-service or for your control or for your power trip. Your authority is a platform for love in the name of Christ. And then he hits him with this. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven. Don't forget that you answer to God and so do they directly. It isn't that it isn't that the slave answers to the master and the master answers to God. It's that both as equals have direct access to God. And therefore you are not their true master. And God is your true master and remember that you will be accountable to God for how you use your authority. And he has no favorites. So you don't get bonus points for being a slave master. Well, how do we apply what we've just read? As I said earlier, I really think that the most uh, equivalent modern parallel that we have is probably our work life. I know it's not exactly the same, but for most of Paul's audience, this was their work life. And, uh, and all of us who have jobs, we wake up each day and go into a secular authority structure where other participants may or may not be playing their role in a virtuous household. And so how do we apply this? But here's a couple questions just to chew on. Employees, if you're an employee, what does your demeanor and attitude at work say about Christ? That's, that's probably a pretty convicting question. It is for me. Are your coworkers and employers glad you work there? Not tolerant. Not resigned to you, but are they glad that you work there? How would your experience of work change if you thought of yourself as though you were working for the Lord rather than people? Man, that's a deep thought experiment right there. If I woke up every day and drove to work saying, God, you bought me on the cross. I belong to you and I'm going to work today with you as my boss, as your agent in this place. Man, I bet that would change a lot. I bet that would change our level of stress at work. I bet that would change how concerned we were about how we were evaluated and by whom. I bet that would affect our genuine motivation. And I bet that it would give us an added capability to handle uh, problems and frustrations at work. I think there's something really good to think about there. How about 
employers. Many of you have employees or you have authority in the workplace. What does your demeanor and attitude at work tell your employees about Christ? Are your employees glad that you're their boss? Are you the model of hard work and integrity and respect and goodwill? This is Paul's call to us here. How would your leadership change if you knew you were accountable to God for how you use your authority? I think these are really powerful tools for navigating life in a fallen world as followers of Christ. And you know, maybe this wasn't the teaching that you were in the mood for today. Uh, you know, but here's the thing. That's the great thing about studying through the Bible. It doesn't give us what we're in the mood for. It gives us what God teaches. And a lot of times that runs right against our mood. He doesn't give us what we want, but he often gives us exactly what we need for life in the real world. And so uh, I'll just leave you with this thought that no matter how mundane your job is, it can be a place of eternal significance because you belong to Christ and because you've been empowered with the words that save and the ability to love. And uh, I, think that that's, I think that that's pretty powerful and useful. Well, we'll draw the line there. We do have a book that we give away. And uh, if you would like to get a, a copy of the free book, Discovering God, just click the link in the description. And I've also put together some discussion questions if you're meeting in a group and you would like to uh, use those, you can just pause the screen here. Thanks for watching today, guys.